recently we asked some of our students here at Holy Trinity just how much does it cost to attend school here? I think it probably costs about 7000 School's expensive. Uh, $29. Uh, a hundred? Seventeen dollars? Twenty dollars? Three hundred bucks, maybe? A thousand? Nine dollars. In the next few weeks, you're going to be receiving a letter from us here at Holy Trinity asking for your participation in the Opportunity Scholarship Fund in Oklahoma. The Oklahoma Opportunity Scholarship Fund is the fund we use to support our students who otherwise would not be able to attend school here at Holy Trinity. We hope you'll take this opportunity to look over the letter we'll be sending out. We would love to have your participation and your support in helping our students here at Holy Trinity. Good morning. And welcome to worship on this beautiful day. Can you believe we're at the end of November and December is just next week? Because I can't. Uh, but with that means that we have a lot of things happening around the corner right here and now even. So this coming Wednesday and Thursday, we have our Thanksgiving uh, services. So Wednesday evening at 7.15 and uh, Thanksgiving day at 9.30 in the morning. They're the same services, but you're welcome to come twice if you want. Um, but just letting you know that. So we'd love to, love to see you there. Also regarding Thanksgiving, we have our Thanksgiving meal uh, today at 5 o'clock. That'll be in the gym and the Family Life Center. So we'd love to have you there. And if you thought, oh, I need to get something, I need to make something, well, have I got a solution for you. Down the hall, we have a bake sale going on. So you can just purchase a baked good item and just pass it off on your own. Just put it on a nice plate, on a nice platter, and no one will know the difference unless they made it. Uh, so anyway, so that's down there, uh, down the hall. Also down the hall, we have our giving tree. Uh, the tree out here in the narthex, you'll notice is bare. That's because we wanted to relocate the, the names down to that tree down there outside of the Luther Commons so that service can have an opportunity. But there are still 20 names on the list uh, as of now. So after the service, if there are any down there, I'd encourage you to take a peek and grab one of those. Be sure to mark your name uh, on the, the list that they have so that way we know who has whom. Um, so those gifts need to be back by December 3rd. So that's, that's why we're setting it up so early this year. Finally, we have our Hanging of the Greens next week. That'll be after services next Sunday. We'll have a few things here uh, set up already to start the Advent season. But to really get this place looking festive, after services at 1 o'clock, we'll be doing our Hanging of the Greens, getting this place uh, really, really festive. So that's exciting stuff. With Advent starting next week, that means today is the last Sunday of the church year. And it's traditionally called Christ the King Sunday, where we look at the coming of Christ, our King, who will come in judgment, but who will also usher us into his kingdom of grace forever. Uh, we long for that day. The bell has called us to worship, and so let us come before our King, confessing our sins to him and seeking his word of forgiveness. I invite you to kneel, but you may remain seated as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. King Jesus, glorious and gracious, mighty and merciful, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to you. We, your spiritually poor servants, humbly come before you, confessing our sins. O King of kings, we are sinners by nature and by choice. Have mercy, King Jesus, for we are undeserving of your kingdom. O Lord of lords, you have commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. Have mercy, O Jesus, where we too often stay put and do nothing and are guilty of the sin of omission. O Prince of Peace, you have called us to obey all that you have commanded us. Have mercy, O Prince of Heaven, for we too often have strayed from your paths of righteousness. Sovereign Lord, we have allowed the things of this world to take your place in the throne of our hearts. Have mercy, O Christ, for we have fallen prey to temptation. Loving King Jesus, by your Holy Spirit's power, be enthroned upon our hearts. Cleanse us from all sin and every evil. 
Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we would delight in your will, walk in your ways, and pay homage to you alone, to the glory of your holy name. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God our Heavenly Father has heard our cries for mercy, and for your sake and mine, he sent forth a Savior, his only Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord and King. Through his death on the cross, Jesus has paid the debt for your sins. Through his resurrection, he offers you new life, eternal life in his kingdom that has no end. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand and let's uh, share the Lord's peace with those around you. I invite you to remain standing as we continue with our call to worship. We speak responsively. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared. A great King over all the earth. Amen. Alleluia. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of the faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Alleluia. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O oh, come, let us worship him. Alleluia. God bless your worship here today.
Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, King who comes to save us. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us worship Him. Lord be with you. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior and King, you reign, you reign among us by preaching, by the preaching of your cross. Forgive your people their offenses that we, being governed by your bountiful goodness, may enter at last into your ever eternal praise. For you live and reign with the Father and the Son and the one God, and now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the children's lesson. Good morning, boys and girls. It is so lovely to see you. I'm here to tell you a story because I was reminded of this story by our readings for today. Today is a day called Christ the King Sunday, but on our, in our reading from the gospel, you know, Jesus doesn't look like much of a king. He doesn't look like much of a king at all, but that's because Jesus set aside his, his kingship, his honor, his glory to become a human and to suffer and die for us. There's a story about in China, there was an emperor. Look at this emperor. He looks magnificent. He's dressed in fancy clothes. Oh man, he looks powerful that he would command everyone's attention. Well, he wanted to see if everyone really loved him. He wanted to see what life was like for all of his citizens throughout China. And so the emperor traded in his emperor clothes and he put them away in his closet and he came out dressed as a servant. Look at his simple clothes. There's nothing fancy about his clothing or anything. It's all very simple. And he went out in service as if he was just someone who took care of the, the soldiers' horses and three of his generals traveled the countryside with him. Here's one, here's another, and here's the third one. Look at this. They traveled throughout the land, all so that the emperor could see his people and see how they lived. Now, these guys, they look like they're important, but again, the emperor made himself look like nothing, made himself look like a servant. No one knew that he was the, the emperor, except for these three. But you know, it was the rule, it was the custom in China that when you were in the presence of the emperor, you were supposed to bow down. You were supposed to not look him in the eyes. You were supposed to bow down. But the emperor said, no, you can't do that in public. You can't bow down to me in public because then everyone will know that I'm the king and I'm the emperor. And so they came up with a plan. Instead of bowing down to him, when he would serve them, he would pour their tea or he would bring them their horse or whatever he would do, they would take their fingers, do this, take their fingers like this, and they would go like this, tap their fingers like this on the ground or on the table. And that was to signify as if someone was kneeling, right? And they were saying, thank you. 
So maybe this week at Thanksgiving, when someone serves you or when you say what you're thankful for, you can sort of bend the knee like that and give thanks to God, give thanks to your king who saves you. But you know, in our reading, even though Jesus didn't look like a king, he didn't look like he ruled anything, that he was powerful, he was very powerful. And there was one person who recognized Jesus as being powerful, one person who was also being condemned. And he looked at Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He had his faith in Jesus that he was going to live forever, just as he had said. And so our prayer, too, is that Jesus would remember us because he is our king and we want to be with him forever. So let's pray to God. Let's thank him. Jesus, Jesus remember, me remember me when you come into your kingdom. When you come into your kingdom. Thank you, thank you. For, all your gifts for all your gifts and for all you've done, and for, all you've done. For, me. for me. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, boys and girls. You can go back to your seats. jealous for me loves like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so.
The first reading is Malachi 3, 13 through 18. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who had feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make my treasured possessions, I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is Colossians 1, 13 through 20. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. As we begin with verse 27 on this Christ the King Sunday, this is an ironic way of declaring Jesus as King. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breast that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, who were criminals, 
were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to Christ, he who comes to save us. Let us now affirm our Christian faith in the words of the ancient Nicene Creed. I believe in one God.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We have come to the end. The end of the liturgical calendar of the church year, and with it we look to the end of time when Christ our King will return in all of his glory. And of course we've come to the end of our sermon series, Uncommon Grace. We've been looking at each line of this simple meal prayer, the common table prayer, and finally we've come to the end. A single individual word, a word that ends and concludes pretty much every Christian prayer. The word, of course, is amen. We could probably say with confidence that amen is a word that we all know and hopefully say regularly. And what's interesting is that it's a word that's common in every language. It's perhaps the most universal of all words. I mean, listen to Christians pray in German, Spanish, Portuguese, French, you name it. When they finish their prayer, they're saying amen. That's the word they use. Amen is pretty familiar to us, pretty common to our vocabulary, especially as Christians. Amen. We say it often. But what does this mean? I think many of us look at the word amen as shorthand for the end, el fin, all finished, all done. I know that there were some kids from my youth group back home uh, in Seymour, Indiana, who thought the same thing. They were at a servant event in a ministry in downtown inner city Detroit. When the group arrived at the host congregation, the pastor of this inner city church gave them sort of an orientation of all the things that they would be experiencing and all the things that they'd be seeing, just so that, you know, they wouldn't have too much culture shock from what they experienced. Little did they know that that culture shock would happen within the first hour of them being there, and it would happen, in, of all places, during the meal prayer. The pastor asked if any of the youth would be willing to lead the prayer, pray for the meal, and to pray for the ministry they were going to be doing throughout the week. And so a young man, Max, raised his hand, and he began to pray, Dear God, thank you for bringing us here safely. And immediately he was interrupted by the pastor who gave out an amen. Max stopped. Max was confused. All the kids there were confused, and they popped their heads up, looked around at each other, looked around at their youth leaders, and didn't know what to do, because clearly the prayer had just begun, but now apparently it's over. So Max said, I guess okay, uh, amen. And that was the day that Max and all those kids from Seymour, Indiana, learned that amen does not mean the end. Amen means so much more than that. Amen is a Hebrew word often understood to mean let it be. Or it can mean so be it. Or it could even mean yes. As I mentioned, we usually associate it with prayer. And when amen is said at the end of a prayer, it gives emphasis to what we've been praying and saying. Saying amen in prayer is another petition to God that we're lifting up to him as if we're saying amen. God, all these things we've been praying for, let it be. Amen. God, we're asking for healing, for wisdom, for, for faith, for strength, whatever it is. God, let the answer be yes. Amen. God, we pray for all these things according to your will. So be it. So be it done according to your will. All of that is contained in that one word, amen, when we say it in prayer. But wait, there's more. Amen doesn't always come at the end of a prayer. Often it's at the beginning of a sentence. And we find this in Scripture all the time, and it's usually translated as truly, or in the King James Version, verily. In other words, it's, when it's used in this sense, it's meaning amen, truly. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the facts. I'm telling you something real, something you can take to the bank, something concrete. And that makes sense, considering an early definition of amen was to confirm or to make firm. In this sense, it carries the weight of approval, of support, acknowledgement, affirmation, and certainty. There's this obscure verse in 2 Kings where amen is used architecturally, you might say, describing the pillars, the doorposts of the temple in Jerusalem. And it's pointing to that firmness, that support of amen. Amen is also closely related to another Hebrew word, emunah, which means faith or belief. 
And so sometimes amen implies faithfulness. Perhaps related to this is the idea of using amen as a sort of contractual agreement or consent or even endorsement to what God decrees or what God does. As in amen, all that the Lord has commanded us, we will do, the people of Israel. Or maybe it's amen, we concur with what God has said. Or amen, we consent to his will and we will be faithful. It was also customary in the biblical world to respond to good news with amen as a glad word of praise. We see this when David announced that Solomon, his son, would succeed him to the throne as king of Israel. And the whole nation responded in praise, amen. Amen is a glad word of praise. And we still use it that way today. If I were to announce, for instance, that I'm not going to preach a very long sermon, people would maybe respond with a glad, Amen. <laughs> or maybe you wouldn't. We are Lutheran after all, and Lutherans aren't too ready usually to shout out an extemporaneous Amen of praise, right? In fact, there's a story of a visitor who showed up at an old traditional Lutheran church one Sunday, and she got a little bit excited about something that the pastor said in his sermon. And she shouted out, Amen, praise the Lord. And she got so many looks in that moment, all of these eyes darting at her. In fact, one person even tapped her on the shoulder and said, Ma'am, uh, we don't praise the Lord here. Uh, another member uh, nearby heard this and sort of came to the woman's defense and said, uh, Yes, we do. It's on page 15 of the liturgy. <laughs> Nevertheless, regardless of how Lutherans use it or don't use it, Amen is a glad word of praise. There's just so much that's contained in this one word, amen, and there's still more that could be said. Isaiah 65, there amen is used as a divine title of God. Isaiah calls him the God of truth, and the, the Hebrew word used there for truth is amen. Interesting. Then in Revelation 3.14, John applies this same title to Jesus. He states that Jesus is the Amen. He is the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation, he writes. Jesus is God the Father's Amen to all that he has spoken in Scripture. Jesus is God's yes to all the promises he's given us. And it's at this point that we might say, Amen, finally we've got to Jesus. Finally we can get to the truth about our king. I mentioned about how sometimes amen is used at the beginning of a sentence, translated as truly. Jesus used it this way all the time. He was often starting sentences out with truly or amen. So pay attention to that. When you read scripture and you see Jesus start out a sentence, truly I say to you, he's saying amen. In John's gospel, we often see him saying it twice, giving it emphasis to what he's about to say. Amen, amen, or truly, truly, I say to you. Regardless, whether he uses it once or twice, whenever Jesus starts a sentence with amen, that's a clue for us to listen up. Take note. You're not going to want to miss this. Pay attention because this is important stuff and it's going to be on the test. When Jesus starts a sentence with amen, we should be ready to say amen in response to whatever it is he's saying to us. When Jesus starts with amen, we get to start with a promise of what he has coming after. Let me say that again. When Jesus starts with amen, we get to start with a promise that he has coming after. And that's exactly what we see in our gospel reading for today. It's sort of a strange passage, as Pastor Hinky mentioned. It's here sort of ironically looking at Jesus as our king. It seems misplaced at first. It's not the most obvious choice for Christ the King Sunday, but there he is, our king, on a cross. There he is, the great I am, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. There he is, the amen, and the son of God who is the amen. There he is on the cross, the truth suffering the fate of a kangaroo court with false 
witnesses. There he is, pinned to a piece of wood, like that, that same titulus, the titled inscription nailed above his head, which said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The crowd shouts at him, hurls insults at him. He saved others, let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen one of God. The Roman soldiers join in. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. The criminal to his left shouts out, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. They rail, they mock, they insult him. All the while they miss the irony that the amen, the truth, was staring them right in the face. He truly was saving them. He truly was God's chosen one. He truly was their Messiah. He truly is their king, and not just the king of the Jews only. He didn't look the part, but it was the truth. And this unusual plan of salvation had been laid out for quite some time now. It started back in that garden paradise long, long ago when Adam and Eve first fell into sin and God the Father made a promise, a promise of a Savior. And when Jesus, the Son of God, heard his Father's plan, his decree, his call to action, Jesus said, Amen, I consent. Amen, I will do all that you command. Amen, I will be faithful. In Gethsemane, the night before this crucifixion, Jesus had prayed to his Father that this cup, his suffering, would be taken from him, if at all possible. Nevertheless, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, amen, so be it. And now the one through whom all things were made hangs there, ready to die. The hand which formed man's hand is pierced with nails. The feet which once walked in the cool of that garden paradise are now pinned to this cursed tree. The one whose heavenly throne of light shines brighter than the sun is now relegated to a wretched throne of darkness and gloom. This king could have commanded angels to come and swoop down and save him and destroy his captors and all of his enemies, but instead he looks to the needs of others. He could have called up to his followers to rise up in rebellion, but he doesn't speak up on behalf of himself. Instead, he simply prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, Father, amen. Let it be. Just let them be. No, this man on the cross sure didn't look like much of a king. He, he certainly is an unusual, uncommon kind of king, isn't he? I mean, when we think of kings, well, we think of a stately man. A king is powerful. A king, we envision, is sitting in a beautiful, ornate room surrounded by gold and, and jewels. He's sitting in a big, fancy, elevated chair that we call a throne. He's pronouncing judgment when necessary. He's receiving homage to his, from his subjects who are bowing before him. That's the image of the king that we want. But this Jesus, he doesn't seem like much of a king. He came into this world, this kingdom over which he rules, but there was no throne to be found. So the Romans kindly provided for him. It was a cross. Now, the cross doesn't look like much of a throne to us. It is elevated, like most thrones, but it's not very chair-like in our usual imaginings. But that's because, turns out, our image of the cross might be a bit skewed. Some of you might remember, if I preached in Lent, but I think it bears some, some reminding. Archaeologists have discovered uh, some victims of crucifixion that they were actually seated upon this platform that was mounted to the cross. Uh, the, the platform was called the sedicula. Archaeologists have also found the body of someone who had been crucified. And what's interesting about this body is that the nail was not hammered into the top of his foot like we usually imagine. That would have been painful enough. But I, I feel like they changed the, the pain pattern when they found out that it was actually in the side of his foot, through the heel. The, in fact, the body that they found still had the nail in it and a piece of the wood from the cross still attached to it. They just couldn't get it out, so they just buried him with the nail. So, so basically, the victim would have been straddling the cross, his feet on both sides of that upright beam called the, the stipes, 
Now, to me, like I said, that changes the pain element because with crucifixion, you're trying to breathe. And so you have to lift yourself up every once in a while. And every time he lifts himself up, the pain of his foot trying to press against the cross, and maybe moving slightly, and the nail inside grinding against bone and flesh, that is just awful. Not much of a royal footstool, is it? But there he is, your king, the amen, sitting on his throne, a cross. See, the truth about our king is that he is humble, and he is giving, and he is sacrificial. The truth our king displays on the cross is a strange sort of powerless majesty and glory, a majesty and glory that we cannot fully comprehend, nor have we ever seen the likes of in this world. It's a throne not covered in gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood. Behold your king, whose throne is elevated, but not much, just enough to hear the taunts of his tormentors and enemies, raised up just enough to be the perfect target for a spitting contest, raised up just enough to still see and hear his mother in mourning before him. Your king sits uncomfortably upon this rugged throne with his royal feet pinned to his footstool fulfilling the ancient prophecy spoken in that garden paradise he shall crush your head and you shall strike his heel and all this he does for you no this king doesn't look like much you wouldn't know it if you saw him but there was one reading there was one person who saw the truth, one man who acknowledged the king, one man who would have knelt in homage to him had he too not been nailed to a tree. The criminal beside Jesus brings his request to the king. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't say the word amen, but it's certainly a statement of amen, a statement of faith. Right, And with this king, that's all it takes. With this king, faith is all that matters. With this king, amen, is not a conclusion, but a new beginning. And what a glad word it was when Jesus declared through his groanings, amen, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Because when Jesus starts with amen, we get to start with his promise of what he has coming after. And what a beautiful promise it is. Again, truly, amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And I think what's even more powerful about this promise from Jesus on the cross comes from what was written in what's called the Jewish Talmud. The, the Talmud is a collection of ancient rabbinic writings and sayings and traditions of the, the elders of the Jews. The Talmud promises, get this, listen up. Anyone who speaks amen with all his strength merits to have opened in front of him the gates of the Garden of Eden. I think that's powerful, so let's read it again. Anyone who speaks amen with all his strength merits to have opened in front of him the gates of the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, also known as paradise. Jesus, hanging on the cross, hanging on for your dear life with all his strength, speaks that amen to open the gates of paradise, to open the gates of the Garden of Eden, all for you. Amen. Truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When Jesus starts with amen, we get to start with his promise of what he has coming for us after. And we can trust in this promise because, you know, another crazy thing I learned about this word amen this week, in Hebrew, amen is only three letters. Most words in Hebrew actually are only three letters long. Amen in Hebrew is Three letters, Aleph, Mem, and Nun. Jewish scholars actually believe that those three letters combined in that formation as Amen together form an acrostic. Well, what that means is that every letter is supposed to signify another word in Hebrew. And these Jewish scholars believe that the, the acrostic is El Menech, excuse me, El Melech Neeman, which means God is a trustworthy king. God is a trustworthy king. And here is Jesus, the Son of God. The Son of God who is the Amen. The Son of God who is 
the amen, our trustworthy king. Amen, amen. Truly, truly, we can trust in his promises because Jesus' amen from the cross is not a conclusion. It's not the end. It's not the grand finale. Jesus' amen from the cross is our new beginning. It's our new life in eternity, in paradise, with him and with all his saints. Jesus' amen from the cross is God's yes to you. Yes, you are my dear child. Yes, you are my redeemed. Yes, all your pain and suffering is going to go away. Yes, Satan's going to answer for all that he has put you through in this life. Yes, victory is yours in Jesus. Behold your king whose throne is now in your heart by faith and in the hearts of all his faithful people. A king who generously makes you a citizen, even an heir of his eternal kingdom. A kingdom with mercy that goes out to sinners great and small. A king who is coming again for judgment, yes, but a king who also welcomes you through the gates of paradise. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how often you find yourself guilty and deserving of your punishment, when Christ comes again, it will be a fulfillment of his promise. Amen. Truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. All because he's a king whose grace is so uncommon and we cannot help but shout out in praise. Amen. Our king is coming, so may we by faith gladly and humbly petition him each and every day saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen, amen. Come soon, Lord Jesus, and be our guest and let thy gifts to us be blessed. Amen. We sing our hymn.
let us come before God's throne of grace with our prayers of intercession. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Christ our King, you alone are worthy of praise and glory and honor. By your grace, you have made us a part of your divine kingdom. You call us to love our neighbor, even alleviating the pain of the hurting and the brokenhearted, leading them to you. Empower us to be boldly committed in reaching out to the loveless, the rejected, the dejected, and those who are scarred and scared by life's troubled circumstances. Remind us that as we reach out in love to others, we are truly expressing your kingship over our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O Lord of life, we pray for those celebrating birthdays this week among us, including Mark Yenish, Julie Herm, Logan Hill, Virginia Kreinbring, Carol McLannan, Megan Lee, Myra Webb, Paul Cantu, Anita Meese, Tony White, Rick Baker, Abraham Gutu, Jeremy Mork, Coitlin Young, Colby Dirickson, Chloe Dewitt, Joe Gerling, Deborah Newman, Jonah Sloop, Tammy Atkinson, Katie Martin, Harlan Ochoa, and Ginger Shearwhite. Let them continue to experience your blessings, and may they be a blessing through every aspect of their earthly life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of love, we pray for those celebrating marriage blessings this week as they mark their anniversaries, including Bob and Vicki Howard, David and Jana Crotering, and Don and Jane Shirt, who celebrate 45 years of marriage. Let the love of each of these couples grow stronger for one another and for you through every joy and sorrow they experience until that day when one shall lay the other into your arms for eternity. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the giver of all good and perfect gifts. And we thank you for the gift of life especially and for the birth of Daniel Hamburg to Derek and Alyssa this past week. We ask you, Lord, that as he has had trouble with pulmonary distresses, that you guide the doctors to care for him and grant to him a full and complete healing that he might be able to go home very soon to be with his family. Lord Jesus, we ask for your healing mercy upon him. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Great physician of soul and body, embrace with your mercy those in need of your healing and comfort. We continue to bring before you George Breesh, Karen Gardner, Lynn Klein, Carly Namkin, Julie Parker, Jerry Parkinson, Stuart Prince, Gary and Michelle Quick, Rose Renner, Renee Rosanelli, Bob Schatz, Jane Shirt, Debbie Swanson, Becky Borrell, and all others in our prayer list and in our hearts. You know their needs, O Lord, so we pray your healing power would attend them according to their need of body, soul, or mind. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And God of all comfort, we lift up to you all those mourning the loss of a loved one and we again lift up to you Helen Honest and her family as they grieve the passing of her husband Keith. And we also grieve alongside the family and friends who mourn the tragic self-inflicted death of an Edmund North freshman, Nathan, this past Thursday. In the midst of grief, tragedy, and questioning, let the healing counsel and consolation of the Holy Spirit direct them to trust in Christ our King, who comes to bring new life. Lord, in your mercy, yeah, Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our King, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we worship our Lord by receiving our offerings and our tithes.
Oh Lord, oh Lord, merciful Father, you have given us everything we have, our time, our talents, and our treasures. And Lord, we humbly ask you to receive these gifts for the betterment of your kingdom. In your holy name, amen. As we come to the end of another church year and look toward the end of time and the coming of our Savior, and King Jesus Christ. It's fitting for us to seek the mercy of Almighty God, and we therefore continue with Luther's revised form of what is called the Great Litany, which stands as a great and comprehensive pattern of prayer on behalf of the church, the world, and for all people. And in keeping with what Luther said as we pray this Great Litany, all those who are able to kneel before the King should kneel before the King. I invite you to do so as you are able. O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Christ, have mercy. O oh Lord, have mercy. O oh Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from all crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you 
to hear us, Lord. To rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word, and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful labors into your harvest, and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We implore you to hear us, Lord. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore, we implore you, you to, to hear us, us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing blessing. Let us bless the Lord. Be to, God. to God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory in his holy church forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen, 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 amen. and amen.
go in God's peace, everyone, and I've got my turkeys cooked for tonight. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Sunday and I need to cut it up. Tomorrow. 